In recent years, education has become one of the most polarizing issues in our nation. But what if a new conservative vision could actually reduce division and strengthen this vital institution? If we think about education as formative, and if we understand that we're drifting from that mission, how do we come back to that place? And how do we use that to start to, to start to sketch a broader vision of what we're doing in early childhood, K-12, and college? On this episode, we talk with Rick Hess about his new book, Getting Education Right. We explore whether a recommitment to a set of core values can actually help to solve many of the education challenges we're facing today. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Defending Ideas is a weekly podcast produced by Sutherland Institute. On this show, we are committed to renewing the principles of common sense conservatism, making you a better champion of sound ideas. Welcome back to another episode of Defending Ideas. I'm your host, Nick Dunn, and this week I'm pleased to be joined by one of the preeminent national education policy leaders that we're privileged to have on this podcast today. His name is Dr. Rick Hess, and he's a senior fellow and the director of education policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He's also the executive editor of Education Next, a Forbes senior contributor and contributing editor to the National Review. And he's also the founder and chairman of AEI's Conservative Education Reform Network. And lastly, he's also a former public school teacher and professor. So, Rick, thank you so much for joining us on Defending Ideas. Hey, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. It's quite a resume that that we, we outlined there, and there's more to it than that. We'll, of course, link to your bio in the show notes. But I think it's important to emphasize that, that you are approaching this issue of education policy. We're going to be talking about your new book from the lens of years and years of experience, both as a practitioner and as as an expert who's studying and talking about these kinds of things. So I think it's important for our listeners to recognize that's the lens that you're looking at this, the the things that you bring to the table. And I want to get into talking about your new book that you've co-authored with Michael McShane. The book is called Getting Education Right, A Conservative Vision for Improving Early Childhood, K-12, and College. So Rick, to start off, I wonder if you can give our our listeners just kind of a general overview. What is the key argument you're trying to make in your book? And specifically, I'm really intrigued that you took this lens of polarization, that we recognize how polarized we are as a country right now. That, of course, affects education policy. Through that frame, walk us through what some of the key points are that we need to remember for folks who who are going to go out and read your book. Sure. Um, Thanks for having me on. You know, I guess the place to start is what Mike and I argue is that schools and colleges, above all, they have one mission, and it's a formative mission. They exist to raise the next generation of citizens and parents and neighbors. Um, Their job is to raise kids with the values that we broadly hold dear, uh, with the knowledge of how we've gotten here, of our uh, accomplishments and our missteps, that that's what they're there for. And more than anything, oh, we fear that schools have lost sight of this mission, that as my colleague Yuval Levin has talked about, um, rather than places of formation, they have become places of performative, uh, of a performative nature. So we have professors and college students and K-12 teachers who spend inordinate amounts of time pushing their agendas and promoting their views and going on TikTok or social media. And this represents to us just a fundamental distortion, first off, of kind of the role of an educator. Now, that's all kind of aspirational and what have you. More fundamentally, I think we wrote the book because I I got recruited from University of Virginia, where I'd been a professor, to AEI back in 2002. So I've been engaged in policy debates going back to the dawn of the Bush years, pretty much. And one of the things that has been frustrating about that is how frequently conservatives have played defense, uh, how, how reactive the conservative agenda has been. Let's, let's make sure Washington doesn't overstep. Let's try to put on the green eye shades and balance the budget. Let's try to push back on some of the crazier toxic stuff coming out of colleges. These are all good things. I don't mean to suggest we shouldn't do those. Uh, but it's not actually a vision of what we're for. Uh, 
It's not actually an explanation of how we're solving problems uh, for parents and students who are sitting down at the kitchen table around the country. The only place where we really tend to do that is when it comes to K-12 school choice, where we're talking about empowering families in ways that make sure they can find the right school for their kid. But that is a piece of a broader set of solutions for the American people. It's not the solution. And so this book is really an attempt to take that impulse. If we think about education as formative, and if we understand that we're drifting from that mission, how do we come back to that place? And how do we use that to start to start to sketch a broader vision of what we're doing in early childhood, K-12, and college, um, where we're actually offering answers and not just pushing back on the things that are frustrating us that are being offered by our friends on the left? Rick, I want to ask you about that that framing. You you have a couple of layers. There's the polarization aspect. There's the, as you mentioned, conservatives kind of being on defense per, in perpetuity for years and years on these issues. And sort of the something you mentioned in your book is this idea of a hunger among Americans for a more cohesive, principled, yet practical, and also aspirational vision for education policy. And so I want to ask you in that context about how you how you define conservatism, especially with respect to education policy, and why that felt like such an important lens for your book. And I, I want to read a quick passage and then ask you to respond and kind of expand on it. You, you and your co-author, Michael, write, this is a book about ideas, not politics. If our past experience is any guide, plenty of readers who don't regard themselves as conservative may come across insights or proposals they find appealing. Good. You're welcome to claim them, whether or not you think they're conservative. At times, such readers may even think that's not really a conservative idea, it's just a sensible one. Great. That passage sticks out to me because you're saying this is what informs us philosophically and how that translates into practical policy solutions, but you also want it to be a broad vision that everyone can accept. Can you get into that a little bit? Help our listeners understand why that framing is really important. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's odd in today's environment, obviously, because we're so polarized Um, that we tend to think in terms of party affiliations. We think red and blue, Republican and Democrat. If you're on the right, you know, the lodestar becomes Donald Trump. And we're not politicos. That's that's not the debate we want to have. We want to talk about what's good for students and learners and families and educators. And how do we get how do we get where we want to be as a country on those issues? And we're coming at it from a a perspective that's informed by, to our minds, the the deep springs of conservative thought, the Burke and the Kirk and, you know, the body of thinking that has shaped what it means to think about the reasons that we believe in the value of tradition, the reason that we're nervous about tearing down things that work, uh, the reasons that we look askance at utopian schemes. Uh, the reasons we're nervous about bureaucratic solutions. Um, these are conservative intuitions. They don't, they don't necessarily have a place in any one political party. If you look at the broad sweep of American history, there's times when you can find this kind of thinking uh, under different party labels. So for us, the key to start from is not what's a Republican or a Democratic agenda, but what's a conservative agenda. And a conservative agenda starts by saying, look, where, wh- wh- whatever you, you may read in the headlines, when you ask American fam- parents and voters, um, do you think it's good for students to learn that hard work is a good thing? Overwhelming majorities say yes. A couple of years ago, the KIPP charter schools abandoned their slogan of work hard, be nice, because they said it was a legacy of white supremacy culture. Most Americans, including most black and Latino Americans, don't think that for a moment. Uh, When you ask Americans, uh, should kids learn that the Declaration of Independence uh, and the Constitution were huge steps forward in the history of liberty? Um, Overwhelming majorities say yes. They also overwhelmingly say that students should learn about the Trail of Tears and Korematsu and Jim Crow. Americans aren't trying to truncate or censor their history, but they sensibly understand just how remarkable and grand the the Americans America's contribution to the world is. And so for us, when we talk about conservative, it's 
talking about those things, applying them to how we think about what's good and true and important in schools, and not shrinking away from that. You talk in your book about this idea of a stewardship, that, that a conservative vision, in this case on education policy, that I, I kind of like it would want to steal that metaphor for other policy areas, that we should view ourselves as stewards of something, which means, as you articulate in your book, that you, you take care of it, you protect it, you strengthen it, and you seek to improve it. And you, don't, and you want to be judicious and thoughtful in how you go about that and not be pulled by sort of the ebbs and flows of mob passions or mentalities or political trends in a given time. In that context of we're, we're, we're stewards of this important thing, which is, yes, education, but maybe more specifically or, or more generally, equipping the next generation with what they need to lead successful, flourishing, civically engaged lives – and you outline a series of core values that ought to drive how we view education. I, w- I want to mention a couple of them. I ask you to expand. First, you mentioned this idea of education as a partnership, that it's a handshake between parents and teachers, between the community and, and the school system. Why, why is that a core value that needs to be defended today? And, and who, who or what are the arguments that are maybe pushing back against that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. You know, when I started, I, 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 taught high, I taught high school social studies in the last century. And, uh, you know, one of the things back then, and then I spent years training student teachers up at Harvard. And when you were supervising student teachers in the Boston schools in the 1990s, it was no trick at all to find pleasant elder teachers who, when you were talking about how a student teacher had did, and you said, well, it looked like two thirds of the class was paying attention, but one third was tuned out. Teachers would say, well, they were teaching everybody who was here to learn. It was understood a generation ago that a teacher's job was to teach the kids who wanted to learn. And if the kids were tuned out, that wasn't on the teacher. One of the great triumphs, a bipartisan triumph of kind of the Clinton, Bush, Obama era was we fundally, fundamentally changed that expectation in K-12. Teachers will no longer say out loud, I can't teach that kid. They might whisper it in the parking lot, but we have changed the notion of what teachers are supposed to talk about to the job of an educator is to try to do their best to educate every child. And that's a wonderful thing. That has been um, a huge shift in school culture that it's easy to take for granted. Full stop. But there was a big price paid when it came to that partnership. Um, in the 1990s, you also found it very easy to find superintendents or public leaders who would talk about what parents had to do to make sure their kids were ready to learn. They would say to parents, you've got to do these things. And part of saying that you're, that educators aren't supposed to kind of make excuses is we also said that talking about parents or kids became blaming the victim. If parents are, are, if their kid's not coming to school, if parents aren't making sure kids are doing their homework, if parents aren't supporting the school when a kid misbehaves, today, school leaders, superintendents, public officials are very nervous about saying, hey, parents, you've got to take away your kid's smartphone. You got to get them to bed at a reasonable hour. You got to wake their butts up and get them to school. We don't say that anymore. And so part of re- and part of the result is that teachers feel like they're being scapegoated. They feel like we won't talk straight to parents or kids, and so it all falls on them. And so part of we talk about parent rights as we should, and the importance of not cutting parents out of important school decisions, but we also need to talk about parental responsibilities about making sure that they're working with the educators to make to do what's right for their kids. And we've gotten away from that. And until we can get back to that, it's hard for us to talk to educators in a way that they're going to find persuasive. It's hard for us to talk honestly about what it means to put kids in a position to succeed or to set rigorous expectations, because you can't do any of that if families um, don't feel like they're part of that equation. There's a specific policy implication of what you just said, and it's this idea of greater curriculum transparency. And I want to get your take on that. Do you do you view that as one of the policy levers to help 
accomplish what you're describing? And if so, how do we advance it in a way that the intent is not, we don't want the framing to be, you know, coming down on teachers and saying, well, you're not doing things right, so we need to check up on you. But it is about this partnership of parents and teachers coming together to say, we together as a community want to know that that we're working together to help our kids. So is, is that a good step forward? And if so, how do we frame it in a way that it is viewed as a partnership building mechanism? Yeah, I mean, I th- so first off, um, Mike and I support something like curricular transparency as part of this. Um, absolutely. Uh, the logic here is straightforward. One of the challenges we face um, is that parents feel like they are getting pushed out of educational decisions. Uh, they feel like they're being treated as passive bystanders. We see this in debates around gender, around curricula, around lots of issues. And parents are right. Um, look, um, I have enormous respect for teachers, but your kid is with a teacher for at most nine months. The teacher's going to, you know, the, they're with the parent for 18 years. The idea that after 60 days or 90 days, we want teachers making decisions on behalf of kids that run against what their parents think are best for them after 12 years, you've got to show me astounding physical evidence of abuse for me to feel comfortable with that kind of uh, that kind of decision. So curricular transparency, though, the trick here is that I don't want to say that every parent is going to be able to dictate to a teacher what their kid's going to do. I think that is an unreasonable standard. And I don't want to create more paperwork and busy work for teachers. So what do we do? I think the expectation should be, how do we do this in a way that invites parents in, that lets them make decisions based on full information, and that doesn't create new burdens for teachers? Teachers have to turn in lesson plans on a regular basis anyway, under existing uh, statutes and school regs. So what you want to do is not ask teachers to put online whatever they're doing this given day, but for instance, put up their units as they exist, or even better, put up the prior year unit so that parents can see it, so they can see it prior to the start of the school year, so they can make a choice about schools or they can raise any questions prior to the stuff happening, which actually makes a teacher's life easier and makes parents more comfortable. And what you get out of that is instead of this toxic cycle we've created where parents are distrustful and the teachers are frustrated and it feeds, what you start to create is the opportunity for a virtuous cycle where parents feel like they have information, which increases their trust, which makes them more willing to work hand in hand with teachers, which makes teachers more comfortable about, than about sharing information. And I think that needs to be the North Star for how we approach this conversation. Rick, in, in the time that we have left, and this is such a, a, a quick overview of your book, I encourage folks to, to go out and get the book and read it, especially those of us who have a vested interest in education, which should be all of us. But especially, I'll give an example. Um, my, my wife and I, we have two little boys. So they're still a few years out from you know these conversations about how and where and in what way do we want them to learn. And they're, they're very young, but we're already starting to have those kinds of conversations. So I want to ask you, as a parent... What should I take away from, from, from this to help inform how my wife and I help to guide the education of our kids? What should educators take away? What should policymakers take away? And is there anything specific in sort of the three buckets of early childhood, K-12, and college that are really important takeaways for our listeners to remember as they're engaging on this issue in whatever way moving forward? Yeah, that's great. Well, so let, me, uh, let me start with the early childhood and higher ed real quick. Uh, on higher ed, Um, One of the things we talk about is conservatives uh, should be cartel busters because we don't trust bureaucracy, um, because we don't trust utopian schemes. We tend to like healthy competition. And one of the things that we have seen take shape in higher ed is between accreditors and student lending and comfortable institutions is something that very much resembles a cartel where you've got to pay a hefty fee in order to get a piece of paper that lets you get a good job like you and I have. Um, we need to bust up that cartel. And we talk in the book about how we start doing that. On early childhood, um, one one of the strange things is how absent the right has been in conversations about how do we solve it. I mean, given the, how passionately many leading conservatives talk about the need to support and encourage family formation um, and two-parent households and how we want folks to have the number of kids 
that they want to have, not feel like they've got to not do it. We should be all over early childhood. And there's a huge opportunity here that the default solution from our progressive friends tends to be what Bill de Blasio did when he was mayor in New York, which is spend lots of money to add a couple of grades on the front end of the K-12 system where parents are putting very little children on buses or taking them to big institutions where they're sitting on a school calendar in unionized expensive schools and those kids get dumped at home uh, at a time that's convenient for the school operations. Well, that's not what most families need. What most families want is early childhood that's close to their place of work, so they're not scrambling to get the kid dropped off. They want something where if their kid is sick, they can go pick them up easily. Huge numbers of working class Americans, 35% give or take, don't work traditional nine to five hours. So they actually don't want necessarily school hour early childhood. So there's an opportunity here to offer early childhood that's more nimble, uh, that's more convenient in terms of work obligations, uh, that's more respectful of family calendars and schedules. Um, Governor Youngkin rolled out something that looks like this in Virginia about a month and a half ago. Uh, there's lots of ways we can go about this, but this is one place where we absolutely need to get off, need to get off the couch um, and start kind of talking about real solutions for Americans. A couple of quick uh, recommendations along the lines of just as parents, you know, the one more than anything, I think, is um, I want parents to be selfish about their kids. Um, you know, my, 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 I, you know, I got two young kids. And sometimes you'll hear that, well, it's selfish to find the right educational opportunity for your kids. What about everybody else? Um, I want parents to be selfish about saying, you know what? My kid should not be on a digital device until they're 16 years old. And yeah, um, uh, they're going to catch a lot of flack from their friends. They're going to be angry at me. But I am going to selfishly hold to what I believe is going to be right for equipping them to be the people I want them to grow into. Um, because I don't think folks have any grasp yet of just how horrific um, a lot of the new devices are for brain formation and kind of moral formation of, of young kids. Um, for educators, uh, I think more than anything, we need to have hard conversations about what does it mean to be a responsible custodian of someone's education. In higher ed, it means assigning more work. It means doing more teaching and less publishing of research in journal journals that no one ever reads. Uh, in K-12, it means making sure we're comfortable with the expectation that classrooms are not platforms from which we share our agendas, but where we actually help students grow and explore and ask questions of all perspectives. And for policymakers, um, above all, I, I think especially the policymakers that I'm talking to, it's we've got to get in the game. We've got to start talking more about how are we solving the real problems and frustrations that are encountered by people and less about figuring out what might go viral. Well, Rick, this is a great overview. Again, I encourage people to get the book. It's called Getting Education Right, A Conservative Vision for Improving Early Childhood K-12 and College by Rick Hess and Michael McShane. Then, Rick, we, we hope to continue these conversations. I think that there's there's this aspirational vision in your book that this can provide some some guidance for a movement for people on, on the right of center of the aisle to help put some of these ideas in practice at the state level, the local level, and throughout the country. So thank you for your time and thank you for the work you do on education for the next generation in America. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me with you. We're going to take a quick break, but we're going to continue this conversation about some of these ideas around education policy right after this break. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Stick around. Sutherland Institute is an independent, nonprofit public policy think tank based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Our mission is to defend the principles of the American founding and strengthen the institutions of civil society essential for those principles to endure. Sutherland provides research, events, and multimedia to policymakers and the public to promote the principles of faith, family, freedom, opportunity, and responsibility. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. 
Welcome back to Defending Ideas. I'm Nick Dunn. We're going to continue the conversation about education policy and dive into some specifics about what's been going on here in Utah and perhaps other states to really understand how we can advance these ideas in a tangible way in terms of education policy for students. Before we continue, though, I want to mention, if you like what you're hearing today, please visit defendingideas.org. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, any of the major platforms, wherever you like to get your shows, just search for Defending Ideas and click that subscribe button. You can also watch full episodes on YouTube and subscribe to the Sutherland Institute YouTube channel and also find short clips from this conversation and previous episodes that you can use in your conversations with friends and family about these issues and also that you can share on your own social media channels. You can get access to all of that at defendingideas.org. Joining me now for this conversation to continue what we're talking about with education policy is Christine Cook Fairbanks. She's the Education Policy Fellow here at Sutherland Institute. Christine, thanks for joining Defending Ideas. Thank you for having me. Christine, I wanted to get your take. We had a great conversation with Rick Hess about about his his book that he co-authored on education policy, Getting Education Right, as it's called. How do we essentially create a new movement in the world of education to sort of recenter the institution on its core purpose. And and I want to dive into some of these elements that he talked about and that he talked about in his book. But first off, I want to ask you for your take on the polarization question. It was the first thing I asked Rick because it was so interesting to me that this is, of course, one of the most important policy issues we deal with. And he approaches it through the lens of polarization, that that in general, all political and policy issues feel very polarized today. Education is certainly one of them. So I wanted to get your your sense that, do you agree that this is just a very polarized field right now? And and if so, why do you think that is? Yes, so it definitely feels very polarized. That's the genuine experience of most people. They feel sort of this acrimony that there's... um, you know, basically two camps, kind of a left-leaning, a right-leaning camp, and that they're often at odds, um, and that there's kind of this growing distrust between them. Um, You know, some people will argue whether or not any issue is really um, framed best on a, in sense of a polarization, because almost no issue is, you know, has just two perspectives on it. But in general, the lived experience of people is that education is becoming increasingly more polarized. Um, and and I think that that just kind of feeds into the reality that it continues to be that way in politics because we view it that way and we talk about it that way. One of the things that stands out to me about this issue specifically with respect to polarization, and I think you touched on something there, that it's not just about, well, there are two sides that are you know, sort of warring against one another, and that means there are two answers on any given issue. It's it's to me, it's less about polarization, and more about just this feeling of division and anger towards someone who disagrees on the issue, regardless of where you or the other person land on the issue, because things seem so pitted pitted against each other, really intensely. And a really good example of that that you've talked about and written about in the past is the, the sort of these two questions of expanding educational choice and options for parents and investing in the public school system. And that was one that came to a head here in Utah when we were uh, considering the Utah Fits All scholarship bill. But it seemed like that's an example of sort of getting past this. So I would love your thoughts on that as, is there essentially a legislative and policy path forward that can address or maybe neutralize some of these feelings of polarization? And is that bill specifically a good example. Maybe a little context on on that would be helpful for our listeners. Yes. So is there a path forward? Yes. Um, Utah is a really interesting case study because they really have rejected this idea of, um, you know, zero sum thinking. Governor Spencer Cox actually spoke about this in his State of the State address where he said, you know, Utah has been ranked as the number one state in the union that rejects zero sum thinking, which is this idea that um, on a you know, a given issue, if one person advances, the other one loses. Um, and so we reject that. We really have this uh, growing track record of consensus building and compromise policy making, where we say, hey, we can address this legitimate issue and address this legitimate issue, even if sometimes those stakeholders are at odds on different policy issues. Because, um, you know, there is, it, it's sort of this false 
choice of paradigm of saying you have to do one or the other. But as you mentioned, Utah, um, they have this track record outside of education, right? Religious liberty, immigration, but certainly in education as well. Um, With the Utah Fits All Scholarship, obviously that's um, education savings account, a traditional education choice um, piece of legislation. And often people say, hey, that is to the detriment of public schools. Um, You know, this is evidence that you don't care about public schools, et cetera. Um, But they really uh, rejected that and paired it with a pretty sizable increase for teacher compensation in the public schools. So that was, you know, showing a commitment that, hey, we still care about these schools. By the way, most families do choose public schools. uh, That's across the nation and in Utah. So we ought to care about both of those. Um, And so I, I think it just goes to show that if you're willing to, you have that ethic of wanting to work together, that you can do it. And it seems like it's it's just a matter of saying these two things that in the public debate are often pitted against one another. In this case, again, traditional schools versus school choice. Whatever the two issues are that seem to be framed as diametrically opposed, if instead we can shift the dialogue and say that, look, there is value that comes from both of these things that that folks out there are saying are against one another. So instead of saying which one can win, the conversation is, is there a way that we can balance these two essential goods together? And, and that seems to be what, what we created with the Utah Fits All Scholarship that paired with teacher raises here in Utah. Is that a fair characterization? It is. And I think, you know, one of the the topics or kind of the themes in Rick Hess's book is, is principles, right? And so sometimes uh, we overlook principles for more policy positions, but that principles can really... Um, create some focus for uh, these conversations, right? And there's a lot of different ways to apply principles, but they also create some space for common ground. You know, we all care about students learning. We all care that it's fitted to them uniquely as individuals, um, that they have positive life outcomes. Um, And so how do we get at those? Um, education choice is one way, improving the public school system is another. But if, if we can agree that we share this principle and the importance of education, Um, and giving as many options as possible and improving every option that's out there, then I think we we find space to move forward. Christine, that's a really good point. And I wonder if that can help create a framework for all of us when we're debating and discussing education policy, because it seems like most of the time people focus on really specific things at very much sort of the tactical level, exactly what curriculum should be taught in schools or exactly what mechanism of funding or type of schools. So people definitely fixate on those things. But do you think it's helpful to sort of pull back and what you mentioned from Rick's book that I'll, that I want to add to, that if you were to boil down kind of his general argument in, in my view, and again, the, these are quick overview, overview, so go out and get the book and, and read it for those of us or, or folks listening out there, but is it is, as you said, it's sort of saying we need to recenter the education institution on a set of core guiding principles. Because if if we don't have those, then, then we're going to be pulled into any polarized tribal debate that comes up. So we need those guiding principles to help us stay anchored. And I want to go through some of those with you. But then the second piece that I think he articulates is this idea of sort of recommitting the institution of education to its proper role, properly understood, of, of preparing the next generation to be thriving, contributing members of society. There's a civics education piece. There's a workforce preparation piece. There's just a general, like, well-rounded human piece. And and so I, I want to get your take on, again, pulling back a little bit. If you were to look in broad strokes at a lot of the fights we have in education policy today, is it too optimistic for me to say that, well, if we could just agree on a set of general grounding principles and agree on recommitting the institution to its proper purpose, wouldn't that solve or at least preempt a lot of the education fights we're currently having? I think it could reduce a lot of them. I mean, it it might not eliminate it entirely because we're going to have differences of opinions, regardless of maybe some shared principles. But um, principles do have a way of being broad and bringing in a lot of different people and ideologies and perspectives. And so if we can kind of back up or have a uh, kind of a higher view on some of these discussions, we might actually be willing to um, find some compromises. I think one of the challenges, though, is to 
articulate what those principles might be. You know, it assumes that we agree on those principles. And so doing a, a good job of of articulating what we think uh, we need to refocus on or what the ultimate purpose of education is, is, is a worthy goal as well. And I, I, the, the purpose of education is also a debate for a lot of people, as you mentioned, you know, is it mostly about creating citizens that can engage in their communities? Is it about finding employment in the end? Is it about, you know, kind of moral character formation? I think it's probably all of those. And I think most people, most reasonable people, can can see the value in each of those lanes. Christine, can we go through some of the specific principles? So, so Rick has in his book, and in our conversation earlier in this episode, he describes it as core values that that should drive. Again, in his argument, kind of the, the this conservative vision for education, but but these core values that should be broadly popular. That the kind of are as you articulated, these principles can be broad enough that a wide swath of parents and educators and voters can look at these and say, well, that's actually pretty appealing. That makes sense to me. The first one I want to ask you about, the way he articulates it and the way they describe it in the book is this idea of, of a handshake between parents and teachers, symbolizing sort of a, a, a partnership. I wonder how you would characterize that. And, and again, this is a concept you've written and sp- spoken a lot about recently, What's the handshake concept? How would you describe it? And do you think that's a really vital piece of education policy moving forward? Yeah, I'm so glad that he wrote about the handshake um, concept because I really do think that it's key. You know, I mentioned earlier that most people do send their children to a public school so they're enrolled where there's an instructor other than the parent who's teaching them. But even in the space of homeschool, sometimes they have homeschool co ops, right? So Um, There might be a a different parent that's actually instructing your child for a time or a lot of homeschoolers are using micro schools and they are now paying uh, to have somebody else teach their homeschool student. Um, So it just most parents are going to have an experience where somebody else is teaching or delivering instruction to their student and creating a relationship of cooperation and communication and saying, you know, we're on the same team for the greater good of this student um, is is really important. And the reason why it's 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 been, uh, I, I think, overlooked is because some of the rhetoric today is kind of a teacher versus parents viewpoint. Right. And that's because I think we've we've politicized education to a point where we do have these um political entities, whether it's those representing teachers or teachers unions or kind of vocal parents groups and things like that. Um, sometimes they get a little bit more airtime of pitting these two groups against each other. And I think most people don't actually want that or view it that way and they can see each other as par- uh, partners. But um, I, I think that that's a, a key principle that most good faith people could get on board with as well. And Christine, from my perspective, it seems to be that there has been a lot of, 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 of again, we keep using the term polarization, but, but on education, that maybe one of the reasons that the handshake principle or this idea of, of renewing the parent-teacher partnership sort of feels innovative or disruptive today is because there have been camps where, where you, you have some people, and we've seen this in some national news coverage from different political campaigns in recent years, and just, I mean, just looking at the landscape of press coverage of education debates, and even just hearing stories from teachers where there might be folks that say, well, it, it's not the job of parents to tell the experts, educators, how to educate the kids. That's the job of the expert educators, let us do our job. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you might say that there there are people who are are distrustful of public education in in pretty intense ways and and want to keep that as much under the direction of parents as possible. Or on the flip side, saying, look, if I as a parent, it's not my job to educate my kid, my kid, that's your job, teacher. So you go and do it. So we kind of have these this sifting into again what feels like it's extreme camps, which speaks to me as as an observer of this. And I'm curious as to your thoughts of what you've seen shake out in, in the meat of these policy debates is this principle of partnership feels radical, but it shouldn't. That's actually what maybe was initially guiding education in the history of our country, and it should be now. Am I right that it just feels like sort of this new idea 
but it's really something that sort of has been important and should be important sort of forever in, in education. Does that make sense? Yes. So, you know, parents obviously have a fundamental right to raise their children as they see fit. You know, there are going to be some extreme or bright line limitations on that, but uh, that includes how they educate their students. Um, and as I mentioned, most people are going to employ um, or enroll their student to, to have a teacher at some point. Um, but really, it's been sort of this recent um, almost revival of, you know, seeking out parents' rights, uh, parents' bill of rights, or curriculum transparency. And you start to think, well, who was trampling on parents' rights in the first place? You know, so it starts to become um, this almost kind of warring or kind of battle language around certain things that are happening uh, in school. With curriculum transparency um, in particular, that has really been, um, I guess, put into this sort of rhetoric as well, where it's um, parents want to see what's happening in the schools because, you know, they're certain that they're going to ferret out some really bad things happening. Teachers view it as, hey, don't come into this space and put all these extra burdens on me. I'm trying to do the best that I, I can. Um, and, and so really curriculum transparency or transparency in general is sort of this American ideal. It's something that everyone sees as a positive, you know, especially if it's a, a public institution. We believe that we are entitled to see what's happening inside of that institution. Um, so it is a, a positive concept that somehow has been put into this sort of um, cultural war. And so there are opportunities still to even look at something like curriculum transparency within this handshake, right, where you give parents opportunities to see what's going on in the classroom, but you make it possible for teachers to do that work. Um, because it is true, uh, if you don't take seriously the workload and the burdens that that would create in teachers, you'll never get that policy right. And so part of that will be rewarding teachers for doing that work, um, in addition to having parents know what's going on in the classroom. That's a really good segue into the question of, okay, how do we actually implement some of these principles in policy? If, if somebody is hearing this discussion or they're reading the book and say, hey, th these are all great ideas in concept and principle, but what are some actual policy levers that we could leverage to implement these things in practice? And I want to kind of draw a connection between some of the other core values he mentioned. We talked about the handshake principle, this parent-teacher partnership. The book also talks about this idea of policy putting family first, and it also talks about being confident pluralists, essentially saying that we recognize that there might be a variety of ways to educate different kids. We should be confident in that and allow pluralism to actually function in the, in the education space. Those, those things and some of the other principles he talks about, to me, kind of tie together and, and back up what you're saying, that curriculum transparency can be a key piece of that. Can you help us maybe turn that into a policy agenda? There's transparency. Are there other things in addition that exemplify, here's how you actually do this if you're a policymaker? Yeah. So as far as curriculum transparency goes, you know, there are a lot of states that have something on the books that say a parent has a right to review what goes on in the classroom. But in terms of practical effect, it doesn't mean too much because there can be a lot of barriers to actually reviewing something, right? Maybe particular hours when something's available or fees that go along with it. So a lot of people have responded by saying, hey, we need to put everything online, you know, almost like kind of a syllabus. And that's actually not a bad idea. Higher ed has been able to pull it off for a long time and, and there's a lot of value to it. Um, but in terms of teachers actually doing it, we need to make it so that it's sort of a, a continuation of what they're already doing. So if they're already uploading lesson plans to say, put it there, uh, put it online, but that's going to take time, professional development days, uh, pay them for doing that or give them additional bonuses if they go out of their way uh, to actually do that instead of creating mandates that say you need to do this or else we'll punish you, right? So I guess the the policy lever there is to incentivize or to reward teachers. And when you do that, you kind of build that trust. Again, if, if every uh, policy solution is mandate and punish, then you do create this feeling of distrust, of um, not seeing them as professionals. And uh, so I think some of the levers there have to be um, carrots versus sticks, so to speak, in policy speak. Um, but also, you mentioned, uh, he, he mentioned the value of putting family first in policy. And that's important because life in reality puts family first in a child's life, right? Like they're their first teachers. That's who they're going to see um, day in and day out. And um, there's even, you know, from 
way back in the 60s. So there's the Coleman report that um, basically boiled down. Its main point was that families have the most impactful influence on student achievement, right? And this is above resources. This is above everything else. Teachers are the most important in-school factor, but nothing really overcomes the family. So we really want to bring family to the focus of um, policy. Part of this is understanding um, what data already exists with regard to family. So a lot of people that are in this space know that you can search data um, by race, gender, income, uh, but there's not a lot of opportunity to look at maybe you know family structure, see how that impacts, even though we know and we've known for a long time and everyone would agree that families have an important impact on students and, and sort of finding that uh, in data would be helpful. And that's that's a policy all on its own. So, Christine, as we start to wrap up, I wonder if you can help us turn this into uh, some key talking points for our listeners. So if they're going out and they're getting involved in discussions, sometimes debates about education policy, and some of the things we talked about today, how can we equip them to say that these these core values, these principles of elevating families as an institution in our society that need to be considered when we're talking about educational outcomes because of the data that you articulated that education outcomes are so often downstream of family structure as much as, if not more than, other variables that we typically measure. Things like that, things like this parental partnership and this idea of pluralism, what, what are some key messages that our listeners can walk away with so they can say, well, this is what I believe about education, the importance of parents, the importance of choice, the importance of transparency. What in your mind and in your experience have you seen be a really compelling message that can maybe help soften some of that polarization, that can maybe help someone who might have a different view be a little bit more open to these kinds of ideas in education? What's a great message for our listeners for that? I think that there's space to compromise. And by that, I, I mean, if you have a specific viewpoint on curriculum transparency or choice or something in the public school, um, continue to have that. Um, just acknowledge that there are other interests that could um, be companion interests as well that could be advanced. And uh, it doesn't have to be an either or. Um, I do think that the language about a handshake between public schools and families or specifically teachers and parents or even with students is really helpful because it, it ensures that everybody also has a sense of responsibility to that handshake, not just what can I get you to do for me, but what can I do to increase this partnership as well? Um, and I think that's going to be that's going to be important both for elevating um, families, but also for building trust in institutions that that exist and that most people are using. Any final thoughts for policymakers who might be listening? Are there other policy levers that, that maybe have been successful in Utah or elsewhere that state leaders across the nation should, should think about? If, if you were to just tick off a couple of things that, man, th this would be a great policy agenda for policymakers who want to reform education policy in line with these ideas. Anything important come to mind that we ought to articulate? Yeah, so... Uh, we mentioned earlier that Utah was successful in increasing education choice by increasing teacher salary. Other states that are interested might consider how they can advance both of those. This legislative session, um, the legislators looked at micro schools and said, how can we both support them and honor um, zoning regulation concerns uh, that people have about them cropping up in different parts of the state? Um, and so created really sensible and prudent um, uh, legislation, basically giving municipalities definitions for micro schools so they know what they are and how they can and can't regulate them. Um, and, and, and that balances different interests, different stakeholders who, you know, maybe care about their neighborhood or people who want a micro school. Um, so I think, you know, looking at Utah's way of balancing things, uh, not being extreme and definitely rejecting the zero sum mentality would be helpful for a lot of states. Well, Christine, I want to thank you for your time. It's helpful to put some context around, again, the, these ideas that I think are aspirational that we talked about with, with Rick Hess, but then being able to show folks how the, these can actually be put into practice. There, there is sort of a path forward for 
policymakers or voters, people who care about these ideas being successful in a way that can reduce some of the polarization. So it, especially in this day and age, I think that's a very optimistic message to end on that there, there's hope, there's evidence that this stuff can work, and we can do it in a way that makes a difference for kids, students, and their families. So thank you for your time helping us to, to tell that story to our folks. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, that was Christine Cook Fairbanks, the Education Policy Fellow for us here at Sutherland Institute. We're going to take one more quick break before we leave you with some final talking points. This is Defending Ideas. We'll be right back. For a deeper dive into the issues you care about, read Sutherland Institute's official blog, Insights and Takeaways. You'll gain deep insights from policy experts and relevant takeaways voters need to know. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. Before we let you go, I want to articulate a few key things that I captured in my notes from the conversation with both Rick and Christine, because I think there's a lot of good stuff here that can help inform each of us to help us create and articulate a better vision for education policy that I think can improve our outcomes and also reduce some of the division and polarization we're feeling. So a few key points in my notes. And number one, this is, I think, applicable to any tough issue that we get into discussing with friends or family or even our elected officials. And that is this, before we get into debating the specifics on any policy issue, we need to understand what our core values are, the ideas that guide us to help us arrive at conclusions of different policy issues. But we need to make sure that we're grounded in sound principle. That's really important because that'll inform everything that comes after the fact. So grounding in those sound principles is important in this case for education. That's my second point is that for education, principles like the parent-teacher partnership, the importance of curriculum transparency, um, things like elevating the family as an institution, especially recognizing how much family stability and family structure does impact education outcomes downstream, as Christine said in our conversation today. And also recognizing that pluralism can be very valuable. Not everybody learns in the same way. It's not always true that one way of teaching will be the best for all students or for all families for that matter. So recognizing that having different ways of helping to prepare the next generation can be actually an important part of our education system. And the last point is that looking at the different components of our society and our system, parents and teachers, traditional K-12 schools, and other things like charter schools, micro schools, private schools, homeschooling, those kinds of things should be viewed as all valuable parts of a robust and healthy education system. And that means that we should seek to facilitate and improve and strengthen all of those pieces rather than pitting them against one another. I think that these points can help in our conversations about something that's really important because that's what education is. It's vital for the next generation and for each of our families. I hope that these concepts are things that you can use in your conversations and that you feel better equipped to defend some of the ideas we talked about today. That is it for this episode. We want to thank you for being with us and remind you, if you liked what you heard today, please visit defendingideas.org. You can find this episode on all of our previous shows. You can also get access to short clips through our YouTube channel at Sutherland Institute on YouTube. And also subscribe to this podcast on any of the major platforms, wherever you like to listen. Just go to your preferred provider, plug in Defending Ideas in the search bar, and click that subscribe button. Once again, that's defendingideas.org. And lastly, if you want to support the work of Sutherland Institute generally, please visit sutherlandinstitute.org slash donate. That's it for this episode of Defending Ideas. Thanks again for being with us. From the Sutherland Institute in Salt Lake City, I'm Nick Dunn. We'll see you next time.